4.6, talking about complex numbers, here's objective one, where you're going to be able to simplify square roots of negative numbers. So negative numbers, when we take the square root, this is where we're going to get uh, imaginary numbers from. So if you take a look at this picture, question is, what do you think of? It might remind you of maybe some kind of electronic circuit. The answer is yes, that's right, because electronic circuits uh, often are uh, applications of complex numbers, just like we saw the Mandelbrot set is supposed to be, but we haven't seen how just yet. So stay tuned. So go ahead and pull out a graphing calculator and use it to graph the equation y equals x squared plus 1. Remember that whenever it's an x squared, we know this is going to be a parabola like a u-shape. Okay, And I want to know what is the what are the x-intercepts. So remember that we're also supposed to have two of these things, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. We could have two roots, one root, or zero roots. So this is the case where we have a parabola and it just crosses the x-axis like so. One root means that the vertex of the parabola is actually on the x-axis, and zero roots means it might be up above the x-axis or down below it, flipped upside down. So maybe you have that graphed already. Let's take a look at it on Sketchpad here. So if I'm trying to find the x-intercepts, I can see very clearly it's not going to touch the x-axis and it doesn't have any. Now, it doesn't have any x-intercepts, but it still has zeros. It still has numbers that whenever I want to find the x-value, that makes the whole equation equal to zero but it doesn't have x-intercepts. Hmm, might be a little confusing. So let's try to solve this quadratic equation. In the last lesson, we talked about solving quadratic equations by taking a square root, and we should be able to do that. Just subtract the 1 over here, so I have x squared equals negative 1, and now I'll take the square root of both sides, and I have x is equal to plus or minus, two answers, the square root of negative 1. Oh my gosh, the square root of negative 1. Problem here, of course, is that the square root of negative 1 is not a real number because you cannot find a number that you can square and get negative 1 back. Like, for example, it can't be 1 squared, because 1 squared is 1, and negative 1 squared is also 1. So there's no real number that you can square to get negative 1 back as your answer. So that doesn't mean that there's no solution. It's just a little bit more complex than that. So, we're going to define these negative square roots in terms of an imaginary unit. Imaginary unit's going to be i, and we're going to define it like this. i is equal to the square root of negative 1. If I square this, i squared is equal to negative 1. So, for example, if i is equal to negative 1, i squared equals, or the square root of negative 1, square root of negative 1 squared a square root and a square are inverses, so they cancel each other out, so I just get negative 1 back. Okay, so here's the foundation of all complex numbers. i is equal to the square root of negative 1, and i squared is equal to negative 1. So this is uh, a question from a tax test a few years ago, and it involves imaginary numbers. So a pattern exists as a result of raising i, imaginary number, to n, some integer greater than or equal to 1. So it's just some sort of pattern here. We want to know what is the value of i raised to the 16th power. So go ahead and pause the video and try to figure it out before you move on. All right, let's check to see if you got that right. Okay, so you should have gotten the answer 1, and here's the reason why. Uh, notice that these powers of i just keep repeating and re keep repeating. So i to the 4th is the last one, and i to the 5th is the square root of negative 1, which is the same thing as i to the 1st. So after i to the 5th, it just repeats again. So i to the 6th, negative 1, same thing as i squared. So you can reason out that i to the 7 should be the same thing as i to the 3rd, negative square root of negative 1 and i to the 8th is the same thing as i to the 4th. Okay, so what this means is that every 4th one 
is going to be 1. Every multiple of 4 is going to be 1. 16 is a multiple of 4, therefore i to the uh, 16th should be equal to 1. Here's another way to do this. i to the 16th is the same thing as i to the 4th raised to the 4th, right? A power to a power you multiply. And i to the 4th is 1, raised to the 4th is still 1. So what this uh, problem shows you is that powers of i are only going to have four possible answers. And that's kind of nice. I've got a 1 in 4 chance of getting it right. So, um, if I have i to the first, i to the first, square root of negative 1, we usually just write that down as i. i to the second power is the square root of negative 1 squared. We know the square root and the square cancel each other out, so I'm just left with negative 1. i to the third power is the same thing as i squared times i i squared is negative 1, so substitute that in there, and so you just get negative i. i to the fourth, we can think of that as i squared times i squared. That's one of the ways you can think of it. i squared is negative 1, so we're multiplying negative 1 times negative 1, which is just 1. So all other powers of i are just going to repeat this same four numbers over and over again. So the question here is, well, then how should I evaluate something really large like I to the 101st power? Okay, I don't want to have to keep writing those things down over and over again. And the answer involves this number 101, dividing that thing by 4 and just seeing what the remainder is. And this one, it's going to have a remainder of 1 because I to the 100 i to the 100, that would be the same thing as i to the 4th power. And i to the 4th power is just 1. But now we still have one more power of i, so that's going to be i. So basically, in order to simplify these powers of i, you just divide the exponent by 4, and then see what the remainder is. Put that remainder as your new power of i. So if you have a remainder of 1, it's i to the first. If you have a remainder of 2, it's i squared, which is negative 1. If you have a remainder of 3, it's i to the third, which is negative i. And if it is a remainder of 0, that means 4 goes into it evenly. It's the same thing as i to the fourth, which is just 1. Anything to the 0 power except 0 is equal to 1. So let's try a couple of these ourselves. i to the 54th power. Remember, all I have to do here is divide the exponent 54 by 4 and see what the remainder is. So when I divide this by 4, I get, goes in there one time with one left over, 3 with a remainder of 2. This means that this should be the same thing as i squared, which is negative 1. Okay, now I'm going to, again, do the same exact thing. I'm going to take 120, divide it by 4, and that goes in exactly 30 times with a remainder of 0. So this means it should be the same thing as i to the 0 power, which is 1. Okay, 89, divide that thing by 4. I know that 88 would go in there evenly, and I'm just going to have a remainder of 1. So, this should be the same thing as i to the first, which is i. 39. Well, I divide 39 by 4. I know it's not going to go in evenly. 36 is the closest uh, multiple of 4, and 39 is just 3 bigger than that. So this should be the same thing as i to the third power, which is negative i. So, what if your number is really big, though? Not just something that's easy to divide. I don't want to have to, uh, what if it's in the thousands, something like that. So, the answer um, is just a, a number sense trick, and that is any multiple of 100 is automatically divisible by 4. So, take a look at this kind of little proof of this. 100 in divided by 4, where n is just an integer. That's what this thing means right here. n is an element of the integers. 
So this represents every single possible multiple of 100 dividing it by 4. So n could be 1 and it's 100, n could be 2, it's 200, and so on. So um, whenever I divide this, I can just separate this out as 100 divided by 4 uh, times n. 100 divided by 4 is just 25n. There we go. And 25n is 25 times that same number before. So that's still an integer that shows you that any multiple of 100 is divisible by 4. Okay, so there's the start of it. The second part of this is all you have to do is look at the last two numbers because everything else of that is just going to be a multiple of 100 and I know 4 is going to go into it. So if the last two digits are divisible by 4, then the whole number is divisible by 4. So let's look at an example of this one. 132. 132 divided by 4. All I'd really look at is the 32. Is 32 divisible by 4? Yeah, sure, it goes in 8 times. So here, this is showing you why this works. This is the same thing as 100 plus 32 divided by 4. Break this up as two separate fractions, dividing the 4 into both of them. So the first 100 divided by 4 is 25. And then the 32 divided by 4 gives me my 8. So I can see that definitely it goes in evenly. So let's just look at quickly a couple of more examples. So 228. I look at 28. 28 is divisible by 4. goes in 7 times, so the whole number is divisible by 4. Here's another one. 316. Just look at the 16. 16 is divisible by 4, so so is 316. So just how you can use this. Then I'll just make up one of these numbers real quick. What if I wanted to find i to the 481st power without even using a calculator? Just look at the last two digits, 81. Does 4 go into 81? It sure doesn't, but it does go into um, 80. So this is going to have one left over. It'd be the same thing as i to the first, which is just i. So let's simplify each of these little square roots here. So if I have the square root of negative 36, I'm going to break this up as two square roots. So I'm going to just break this up as the square root of 36 times the square root of negative 1. The square root of 36 is just 6. And the square root of negative 1, we define that as i. And here we're just talking about the principal one, so we don't have to worry about the plus and the minus business. We only have to do that whenever we're solving an equation. Okay. So we'll do the same thing here on this uh, number 2 here. Square root of 13 is the same thing as the square root of 13 times the square root of negative 1. Square root of 13 doesn't simplify, so I'll just write that down and then tag an i at the end of it for the square root of negative 1. So here's the problem though, is that it's not really clear whenever you write this out, depending on your handwriting, if that i is underneath the square root or not. So we usually put that in front, so i square root 13. But whenever it was just a whole number like 6, then I put it at the end. Okay, let's look at number 3 here. Um, so if I have a quantity here that I'm squaring, I can just square both pieces inside of the parentheses. So this is the same thing as i squared times the square root of 5 squared. i squared is negative 1. Square root of 5 squared, those cancel each other out, is times 5. So I just get negative 5. So let's summarize these in these two little properties here. Okay, so if r is some sort of positive number, then the square root of negative r is equal to i square root r. So just for example, you don't have to break this up as two square roots as I just did. If I see the square root of negative 5, I know since that negative sign is underneath the square root, just bring it out as an i, so i square root of 5. Okay, number 2, i square root of r. No, notice that it's not negative under here. Whenever I square this out, I just get negative r back. Look back at this previous example, right? I just got my number back, but it's negative. And that's exactly what this number right here, or this example, is showing. 